Quigley in five, underwater in the yellow lane. Jess Carling of Great Britain. Quigley goes through, the silver to Jess Carling, wonderful silver medal for Great Britain. Welcome to the Honest Athletes podcast with Lauren Quigley and Jazz Carlin. Welcome back to the final episode of season two of the Honest Athletes podcast. And this season seems to have flown by. So thank you all for listening. Um, this week, we are both so excited to be talking to this week's guest. I feel like there's not much this incredible woman can't do from competing and winning medals in bobsleigh, multiple medals in athletics, and also performing on The Voice. There's just so much to talk about and I can't wait to dive into it all. So welcome to the podcast, Jazz. Sawyers. Hi guys, thank you so much for having me. What a nice intro. Thank you. We do always like introducing and I think it's only when you actually look back and think of all the things like I was actually looking back to some of the days of your early career and all the things that you've done and you're like wow um, how much you've done but even when I mentioned to Lauren about getting you on the podcast she was like oh my god that would be amazing. She was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm excited to be on. So thank you. Yeah. Well, like Jazz just said, I'm super excited to have you on. Before we even started recording, I was laughing so much. Um, and you also told us about green tea story. So if anyone's listening and they like green tea, apparently you should not put boiling water in it. So Jazz, could you just quickly explain the green tea story? Because that's interesting. Yeah. You know what? I think this is a much better fit for people who think they don't like green tea. People who do like it, you're probably fine. Crack on with whatever you're doing but if you don't like green tea maybe you're just burning it uh, whenever I get asked on sort of podcasts or interviews for like a life hack I always give this one you need to put cold water cover the bag in cold water first and then put the boiling water on so that you don't burn the green tea the reason it tastes so bitter so often is because it's burnt um and it's so much better when you prepare it properly and it's actually you can taste the delicate flavors it's got rather than it just being this bitter burnt hot drink So there you go. Green tea (laughs) straight away. This is amazing. But we want to start right at the start. We love to start right at the start. I have listened to podcasts that you've been on. I know a lot about you started in gymnastics, bobsleigh, long jump. There's so much to talk about. But could you just explain your start in sport and how you've sort of got to where you are right now? Yeah, completely. So like you said, I started in gymnastics when I was sort of four maybe um somebody came to the school uh, I think my auntie suggested that I go and um I go and do it properly and I took up gymnastics competitive gymnastics from a young age um I really enjoyed it I wanted to go to the Olympics for that um, but I was never going to be good enough I think by the time I was about nine it became clear that I wasn't going to be international level at gymnastics um and while you know for a kid of nine you'd think that'd be fine and I could just enjoy my sport no uh that wasn't enough for me at that point I'd already watched the Sydney Olympics in 2000 and I knew that that's what I wanted to to go to the Olympics and so when I tried athletics in school I begged my parents to let me move over to that I eventually did move over to athletics and was doing combined events so I started out in a pentathlon I think you actually start as number 13 doing quadrathlon I don't think you even do five I think you just start with four um gradually worked my way up to heptathlon um which is what I competed in in 2011 at the world youth championships um but that same year I also took up bobsleigh um I moved to a boarding school to, so that I could train full-time for athletics. And while I was there, British Bobsleigh came um, looking for athletes for the Youth Olympics. I decided that would be a good, fun idea uh, and tried out for that team, got involved in bobsleigh. And then because I spent two winters doing bobsleigh, I wasn't really fit for heptathlon anymore. So I dropped down in the summer to just a long jump um, instead of seven events, just dropped down to one. Um, and then since then, and that was in 2012, I have been just a long jumper. I say just, it's still, it's still work, but it's nothing like being a heptathlete or a bobslayer. Uh, it's a bit different, but no. So that's, that's how I ended up in long jump. Um, and then I've been kind of trying to tick off career goals in the long jump since then. And uh, hopefully one day I'll be able to go back to bobsleigh because it's so fun. Isn't it so mad that you say about gymnastics at nine years old, like you could kind of tell or see that you weren't maybe going to make it in gymnastics. It's crazy, really, because even in swimming, I think you can maybe have some standouts, but it's not till you get quite a bit older. But gymnastics is such a big commitment at such a young age. 
It really is. I don't know if that's still the case now because I've not really, you know, looked into elite gymnastics nowadays. But then people were telling me, you know, that you haven't got what it takes. And you kind of tell a nine-year-old that and you sort of go, okay, well, I haven't, I guess I haven't got what it takes, but I wanted to find something that I could be good enough at to go and compete at the Olympics and ideally win the Olympics. You know, that's what I've always dreamed of doing. Um, And at that age, people that were at the top of the rankings, people that were doing the best against me, some of my teammates um, were being told, yep, you have the potential to go on to international level, but the rest of you, no chance. Oh, it's just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And even I was hearing a story the other day of, um, I think she was nine or 10 and the commitment was like 16 hours a week of gymnastics. And it's like, whoa, yeah. like and a nine-year-old to train so much. But as you said, I guess you had that dream of going to the Olympics from gymnastics. Were you, were you competitive as a youngster? Did you love that competition and the race inside of it? The comp- Yeah, I was insanely competitive. That's all I ever wanted to do was compete. Um, I didn't love winning so much as I hated losing. Um, I just was a horrible, horrible loser as a child. My family will tell you I was a nightmare. Um, but having sport meant that I had an actual useful outlet for that competitiveness. And I think the, ma- the hate in losing so much made me better um, because I, I was so determined to make sure that I didn't lose again. Um, so that's kind of what would drive my training as a kid. And, you know, it, it, it worked. Um, I still hate losing. I'm, I don't quite throw the same temper tantrums. <laughs> Um, at least not in public. <laughs> um, yeah, my mum might disagree with you. Uh, but um, I still hate losing, yeah. But every single athlete has a different way of approaching competition and what drives them. And so for you, when I was looking at your career and I, I clicked on your achievements and I was scrolling for about 20 minutes, like, wow, okay, this girl has done a lot of amazing stuff. Um, and I did, I wrote down very driven very driven and that's really hard to find especially nowadays with the youngsters I find it's hard to find that in people so it's an amazing quality to have but I I always like to touch on and so does Jazz that we had very supportive families Jazz only child I had a brother who also swam and just our families were amazing in supporting us and we know that not everyone's lucky enough to have that support what was your family role in your sport and how's that been? My family was also really, really supportive. Um, my parents, well, I've got two younger brothers, um, both of whom were involved in sport when we were kids. So I don't, but different sports. So I, don't, I really don't know how they did it. Um, we had a lot of help from uh, sort of not immediate family. So aunties, uncles, grandparents. Uh, it, was, it was a full family effort, honestly. Um, just caught me off the gymnastics. One of my brothers was doing a martial art. The other one was playing football. It, it was chaos, but they wanted us in sports. I think my parents have always seen the value of sport um, and have always encouraged our competitive nature. And so when I wanted to, to push on and do more, they've always been supportive of that. You know, at 16, when I said I want to apply for a scholarship to a boarding school so that I can train more, um, they were supportive of that. They were a bit sad to see me go, I think. I think maybe once I'd left, they weren't too mad. Um, <laughs> but they were very very supportive they you know helped me apply took me down to the open day um and then when I phoned them up and said hey I think I'm gonna take up bobsleigh they kind of said oh, that sounds a bit dangerous but yeah go for it um it sounds like fun I think you know some people ask will your parents push you because I've done so much so many different things um with my career and the, the opposite couldn't be more true they're not they were never pushy. They were always supportive. But if anything, they, they are the ones saying, do you want to slow down a little bit? Because you've maybe taken on a little bit too much there. It was never a, yep, yeah, you have to, you have to, you have to. It was on your commitment, yes. So, you know, if you've committed to, to play this sport for this long or if you've committed to this team, then you have to honour that commitment. But ultimately, we're going to support whatever it is that's going to make you most happy. And were you quite a standout performer as a youngster you know um I guess one of the best in your age group how did you compare to some of the other athletes at a young age yeah in in the jumps and the sort of sprint hurdles I was um so long jump from a really young age I I was winning like age group national championships uh winning or coming second if I was coming second I was always coming second to Katarina Johnson Thompson um so it's not a bad name to have been behind <laughs> um but yeah I, I was I was good as, at a young age and I think that's what um what fueled me to carry on because you know some people have just ground it out from 
you know, maybe somebody, somebody different would have taken that gymnastics route, heard you're not going to be good enough and used that to say, well, actually, no, I will be. But I'm not that kind of person. I'm not the kind of person who you tell, oh, you can't do it. And that spurs me on. What spurs me on is people telling me I can do it. You know, I don't do things to prove people wrong. I do it to pr- prove my supporters right. Um, it, that motivates me a lot more than somebody telling me you, ca- you can't do it. Um, so, yeah, I think that... I'm glad that I was good at some of it from a young age. I found the transition into senior athletics initially great because my first ever championship was Commonwealth Games and I won a silver medal. I wasn't expected to, but I was like, oh, people complain about this transition from junior to senior. It's easy. I've just turned up, won my first medal, no problem. And then uh, I didn't even make the Europeans team and I got a swift kick um, to my ego when I realized that maybe you're not as good as you think you are and maybe you need to do a little bit more work. Um, so yeah, I spent a few years actually settling as a decent senior athlete and I still don't have any global medals, I'm working on it. Um, so technically I'm still trying to push myself to those levels that I was at as a junior because I've got junior medals at world and European level and Olympic level um, at the youth Olympics, but um, not in the seniors yet. It's coming, I feel it. <laughs> I hope so, I think so. 100%. I listened to one of your TED Talks, uh, Quitters mm-hmm. Never Win, Winners Never Quit. That wasn't the title, but I remember you talking about that in there. And so, and it's really interesting hearing you talk and look at your career from switching different sports. You're lucky to be so good at, at all these different sports and be able to do that. Do you think that that the ability to do that, to have done gymnastics, athletics, bobsleigh, long jump, all the different events in athletics. Do you think that's helped your career in terms of the longevity of it and sort of keeping things fresh a bit? I know you've been doing long jump for a long time, you know, and it's not like you've just done it for a couple of years, but you have gone in and out of different sports. How have you, you, yeah, do you think that's helped you in in the longevity? Yeah, definitely. And I think... You know, I agree. So you're lucky to have been good at those things. And I I was lucky that some of them I tried and I was good. But the bobsleigh, for example, when I first started, the raw skill in terms of the speed and the power, yes, I had it. The bobsleigh itself, god awful. You should have seen my first week of bobsleigh. Tragic. Just disastrous. I wasn't good at it, but I was willing to try a bunch of different things. I've always been the kind of person that would say yes. Um, And... I've never, and I think this is down to my parents and the way they brought me up. I've never felt the need to be boxed into one thing. I've never gone, okay, I'm good at this. So I have to just do this. Uh, And I think that's what some kids, you know, you see the sort of 10,000 hour thing get pushed. And it's like, you've got to spend all your time on this one thing if you want to be good at it. Um, Maybe not. Maybe you should try a bunch of different things and realize that actually there's more to you than this one specific skill that you've managed to, to hone. Um, because you know, a lot of people look and go, Oh, you've done loads of different things, you're just good at loads of different things. It's like, well, how many things have you tried? You might be good at loads of different things. Um, and I think people now it's getting much easier to do that when you can uh the, the things you can do on the internet and things you can learn on the internet, I think people are getting a lot more open to trying different things, especially as athletes. And um, you know, I'm seeing athletes start side businesses and do different things all the time. Um, but I think willingness to try has been a really positive thing for my career. Um, but you, you're right, it also has kept things interesting. You know, I like to, I need constant stimulation. It's very annoying. Uh, I can't just sit and do nothing. If I have a gap in my schedule, I'll generally fill it um, with something. And so having all these different aspects to my career has kind of kept me happy, which has kept me going. It's madness, all the different sports. But as you said, I think being able to try something, that's one thing I always say to kids and they say, oh, I can't do this. I'm like, well, have you actually tried? Have you actually really tried? And and the thing is, you said, bobsleigh, you gave it a go in the first week, you weren't great. And like, it's actually being able to overcome that it's going to take a bit of time. It's not like you can obviously go into something and just be amazing at it. You have got to work hard at it. What, as out of interest, what were the things, I guess you said, because I know a lot of the winter sports do go into schools and sports centres to scout out athletes. What were they actually yeah. looking for in bobsleigh out of you to see whether you'd be fitted to, to be good at it? So the reason I, I, I jumped at the chance is that the, the tests were standing long jump, standing vertical jump and 30 metre sprint. 
And it was like, that's just my training. That's just what I was doing day in, day out. You just figured out I would be terrible at bobsleigh. <laughs> really bad vertical jump I'm very bad at long jump and I'm very bad at sprinting so that's me out of it I'm I can't consider a, a new career in bobsleigh <laughs> <laughs> but until you give it hey you never know you never know there's other, there's other things the um that was for a brake wing position and obviously you need those skills as a, as a pilot as well but the pilot needs different skills um you know as a brake wing, once you're in the sled you just tuck in and hope for the best um, but as a pilot, you need to be able to learn the track and be able to sort of see what's coming and have very fast reactions and be able to feel pressure well, and not just the pressure in the sense of it's a big competition as in physical pressure, pushing down on the bobsleigh, being able to feel and, and manage that. So it's just a few different skill sets. You never know, Jess. You never know, Jess. Absolutely. I'd love to throw you down a bob bobsleigh. <laughs> whatever track it's called or whatever that'd be great and I'd love to, to obviously go into the bobsleigh stuff loads of questions you acted as a brake woman Correct. now I'm going to I've said that as if I know what that is but why is a brake woman you pull the brakes that's okay so, <laughs> so so it's a two-man bob you're literally sat behind yeah so some people think that you brake on the corners to like get optimum no, there's no braking until you're finished. So basically my whole job as a brake woman was to push the sled at the start as fast as we can before you get to the first corner. Um, there's like the starting bit. I've forgotten all the terminology now. It's been a few years. Um, you sprint, you jump in, you hold on, you hope you don't crash. And then you have to kind of learn the track as well because you need to know when you're finished. And once you cross the finish line, then you pull the brakes. Amazing. And so how do you how do you qualify for the Olympics in the Winter Olympics and bobsleigh and all that? How does that happen? So at the time, um, we qualified our spots via specific qualifying races. Okay. Um, so they had because it was the first ever Winter Youth Olympics, they had to set up a series of um, youth qualifying races. Uh, so GB managed to qualify two sleds so for the women, one for the men. And so we had uh yeah four of us girls out there um competing our sort of first olympic experience and the pilot that i competed with misha mcneil is still the gb number one bobsleigh pilot so she stayed in bobsleigh and um she's she finished eighth at the last winter olympics um she's doing great wow and um just just quickly how old were you when you got your olympic when you were at the olympics for bobsleigh uh so the youth olympics for bobsleigh i was 17 right so um yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, at that time, you couldn't start bobsleigh until you were 16. You weren't allowed to start learning to, to drive until you were 16 just because it was dangerous. I'm not sure if it's slightly different now. Um, so everyone was relatively new to it. Um, but it was just the most fun. I can't even tell you. Just the most fun. Bobsleigh is amazing. If you ever get a chance to go down in a taxi pub, do it. Do it. It's scary, but it's really fun. I was going to say, you say fun, but like that is quite petrifying. And a lot of people would probably be like, I'm not sure I would want to throw myself down. At what speeds do you go at, actually? It's like super quick, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty fast. I'm not sure. I wouldn't want to overstate how fast we were. Uh, but I know the sort of the top guys are going like 70 plus miles an hour. Um, and, you know, you kind of, it's you, bobsleigh, a helmet, and then your little lycra too. Did you feel any like more nervous, the same, or was it just that same kind of adrenaline that you used to get with athletics, gymnastics, all the other sports? Oh God, very different to, because in athletics, I don't fear for my life. Um, so there was no kind of, <laughs> there was no worry like, well, I'll make it down the track. Am I gonna make it out of the sand pit? Yeah, you'd be fine, babe. Um, but bobsleigh was a little bit different because I spent my first week crashing because I was so bad at it. Um, I was, cause I, I started to learn to drive. Uh, that was not for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, was, I was never gonna be a bobsleigh pilot. I was definitely a brake woman. Um, and I started to learn to drive and I crashed and I crashed and I crashed. And so then, you know, all I really knew was crashing to start with. And to be fair, crashing, the idea of it is worse than what it is, unless you have a really bad one, but I never had a really bad one. I got lucky. Um, so yeah, scary, Just way scarier than athletics. Athletics is only scary in the sense like I'm nervous about competing well. Bobsleigh is scary in the sense of like, I'm nervous that I might fall out onto the ice and crack my head open. I can I can imagine being scared about that one. I can definitely imagine that. I don't think jazz, I mean, I can't speak for you, but I definitely never dived into a pool thinking, am I going to make it out of life from here? <laughs> 
I can't imagine what that feels like, to be honest. So you obviously did very well there and you have said that you want to return um, yeah. post athletics, which is very exciting. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, but you did then go into athletics. I'd love for you to tell us a bit more about that transition back into athletics and where you were at the time and all that. So I never really transitioned out. Um, the summer, what year did I go off? So I started the school in 2010, um, started bobsleigh in like the November of that 2010. Um, but I went to the school on a, on a athletic scholarship. So I was doing athletics the whole time. Whenever I was home, I was training for athletics. Um, and then when the indoor season and athletics came around, I competed as usual. Um, it was only sort of winter 2011, 2012, and there was a big difference because I had to put weight on for bobsleigh um, because the you can have, there's a weight limit and you want to be at the top of the weight limit, but the weight limit is the people and the sled. So if the people are light, you put weight in the sled because you want, you know, gravity. Um, and you don't want small people pushing a heavy sled, so they encourage you to gain as much useful mass as possible. Um, and that mass was significantly less useful for long jump when I'm kind of fling myself in the air. And so then I had to sort of spend at like 17, 18, try and spend a few months losing the weight that I gained for bobsleigh um, to get back into athletics. So that was a bit of a, a difficult transition. But to be honest, I don't really remember thinking that much about it. I was so on the go. I was trying to do my A-levels. I was at the time head girl at school and we, we had a lot of responsibilities as head girl. And it sounds, now it sounds trivial, like, oh, I was head girl. But we were, you know, sports aid. Like we had, we had to organize the sports aid event for the whole school. I think it might've been a way for the teachers just not to have to do it themselves. But um, <laughs> we did that. So there was just so much going on. I was training, I was studying. I was trying to catch up on what I'd missed when I'd been away from Bobsley. And I never really notice the sort of quote-unquote transition my only focus was finishing my a-levels and getting the grades that i wanted and qualifying for the world juniors in athletics which was that summer um at that point i was thinking maybe one day i'll go back to heptathlon but i wasn't going to that summer because i just wasn't ready and i just thought okay run jump in it's long jump it's bobsleigh it's long jump it's the same thing just lose some weight you'll be fine and i was i was fine i was pretty good actually i ended up with a bronze at the world juniors that summer and then i just stayed in long jump from then onwards so it never really felt like I left athletics I just kind of spent the winters instead of spending them slogging away doing split 400s on the track I was on the ice just sliding around it was great fun and as you said a lot of it when they're measuring it is about the long jump your vertical jump which I guess and the speed work which I guess is part of your training day-to-day -day anyway with athletics exactly so much of the training was similar there really wasn't that much obviously apart from the stuff on the ice but in terms of the, the skills we were do, using, we were doing sp short sprint training. We would do um, Olympic lifts, squats. It was all the same kind of stuff. We were trying to build speed and power. And that's exactly what you're trying to build for long jump. Um, so it was only really the specific skills that were different. Yeah. It's so interesting, then, though, how you can actually. And I think that's sometimes what I try and say to as many kids is open your mind a bit more. That it's like mm -hmm. even from a swimming background that can go on to so many different things but as you said with athletics there can be so many different pathways and don't always shut yourself off and I think it's great hearing you say you're just a yes you just want to say yes you want to try yeah. things and being able to learn new skills and how exciting is it that you can look back and have done so many different sports and competitions but when was like I guess from swimming we talk about and it's a very young age sometimes you'll see girls win olympics at 15 years old 16 years old and it still sometimes blows my mind that they could be doing their gcses and winning olympic gold medals um but athletics seems to be a bit older in terms of the age group um you seem to kind of develop i guess that strength and power as you do get a bit older when was like your first kind of breakout year on the senior level when you actually thought oh i might might actually be able to go on to that world level where you're competing against the best in the world i think it was 2016 so 2014 was when i won my commonwealth medal but then i still hadn't jumped a distance that was going to get me anywhere um I'm not going to say I got lucky because I competed well, but what happened at the Commonwealth is it was chucking it down with rain. All the favourites were from Caribbean islands um, and they didn't cope well with the rain and I'm from Stoke. And so I was able to just... <laughs> um, British, hey? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was able to treat it like a just the standard Tuesday evening session and um, and and jumped well enough to, to win a silver medal. But that, that distance wasn't even enough to qualify me for the European champ. So it wasn't like I was I'd suddenly burst through the ranks then. Um, but in 2016, I got I went to the Europeans and I got a silver medal in preparation for the Olympics. So I thought, okay, well, this, you know, I've, this is my first 
um, senior medal that's actually with a decent distance. It was with a really respectable distance. Um, and then I went and finished eighth at the Olympics. And so then it was kind of like, all right, this is, this is real now. Um, I'm at the stage where I am, I'm playing with the big girls. You know, I'm not just kind of skirting around on the outside. Um, I am actually good enough to be here. But I haven't, so since then, that year, uh, 2016, I jumped 675. I've only improved 15 centimeters in those five years. So I've now jumped 690. Um, but in terms of me as an athlete and me competing, I've improved so much. Um, it's just that I haven't quite seen that big jump in distances yet, which I still think is going to come. I, you know, I look at my, I've jumped to personal best this year, first one in a couple of years. And I, I think there's a lot more in the tank because once you start pushing seven meters, you, you're talking about medals. Um, you know, and that's, that's where I want to be. I I'm in the sport to win medals. That's absolutely what I want to do. Um, so I think 2016 was the first year I went, okay, I, I know how to be here, but I've spent the five years between then and now uh learning the sport because it, it is different to when you're um a junior but often I have to go back and look at my junior jumps when I didn't know all the things that I know now when I was just running very very freely um I've got a couple of videos where there were fouls but they were big they were up around 697 meter kind of jumps and that's when I was 18 and I almost knew nothing and so I have to remind myself sometimes that empty your mind occasionally because you maybe know too much and you're thinking too much and it's and I'm sure you guys have experienced the same thing as once you know how it should be you you can obsess over that but when you're a kid you don't know how it should be you just know what it feels like and you just go I'm just going to run as fast as I can and jump as far as I can and sometimes I think it should be about that for us adults as well I definitely can relate to that uh, one of my coaches that I had who was brilliant used to say to me before I go down to a race clear your mind, fill your heart. That was it. Clear your mind, fill your heart. Um, and it just helped me go, yeah, okay. I don't need to overthink this, you know, let's mm -hmm. go right back. Just do what you do every day in training. And that's what it's all about really, isn't it? So um, I did read somewhere and I think I watched it on YouTube. Is your best 6.86 meters? It was until like two weeks ago. I jumped right. 6.19. <laughs> okay, so I need to rewatch that, but I thought 6.86, crikey. In swimming turns, how much, how far is that? So when I was at the pool the next day, I was stood <laughs> on the side of the pool, the flags are at five metres, and then obviously uh -huh. beyond that, and I'm just like, how has she got from there to there? All right, she gets a run up, but when, <laughs> going, when, when we used to go and train in South Africa, we'd try and run and jump and touch the flags. Yeah. And it was um, incredible if someone actually touched them. And that's only five metres. So I'm just like <laughs> mind blown. You get a uh, to do, I mean, you'd absolutely smack. We see like men, like our sprinters in swimming and they're going for the flags and they're trying to get it. We need to see you do it. Yeah. Oh, oh, you, you know what? You need to bring, bring a bunch of long jumpers in and humble those men. Because <laughs> I'm telling you. It would we'd be able to take a, a few steps of a run up and just tap it. Bring some female long jumpers in and let's we need to. Them. We need to, because that would be absolutely amazing. So you've said you've just obviously beat that two weeks ago. What I wanted to ask you, when we do a swim, we know before we've touched the wall, really, if it's a mm -hmm. PV or if it's a great race. Is it the same for you or is it the same as everyone else watching? Oh, how far did that go? Is it good? You know? It's funny because usually I'd say, yes, absolutely. You know when it's big, but this time I, so I've been out in America for about two and a half months and I've been competing almost that whole time. And throughout the maybe six weeks that I was competing, um, I had so many fouls that were about that far. So where I've, I've touched the plasticine by like one centimeter and I've been going about 690, 695 plus. And so I've, I already knew what it felt like. So I've been doing that over and over and over. So when I did this jump, I was like, yeah, I felt fine. But it didn't feel like something I'd ever done before. You know, you know, when you, like you're saying, you touch the wall, you know, that's better than you've ever done it. It didn't feel like that because I've been doing it, but just in the wrong place. It's just too close, <laughs> just too close to the board. And so I got out and I was like, okay, that's, that'll be my best one of the day. But I wasn't sure. And I saw the coach that had been helping me that week because um, they had a, a paper tape measure you know often they've got electronic ones but they had a physical one and I saw him go yes and I was like oh what is it what, what, what have I done um and the, the official was six meters six nine zero six meters ninety and it was just oh I'm so excited because it 
the Olympic standard was 682 and I hadn't didn't have it yet. Um, so I wasn't even up for selection, up for contention at all until then. Um, and then, which is an, another thing you don't have to contend with in swimming, but the wind, I had to then check the wind was legal because a few weeks earlier I had jumped the Olympic standard, but with a two, two point something wind that was too strong. Um, it doesn't count. So then I, as soon as I've, I've heard him say six meters 90, I look over at the wind gauge guy and I'm like looking at him like, go on, tell me, tell me, he just gives me the thumbs up. And then, yeah, I'm going nuts and, um, oh, so relieved. So yeah, I, you know, it's good. I think the first time I go over seven meters, I'll know about it. Definitely. When I jumped my 686 PB, I knew it was good. Like you, you spend that little bit longer in the air and it's what, it's gotta be such a fraction of a second, but you know, as soon as you've taken off, your foot hits the ground and sometimes you just get that connection with the board and it's just right. It's just, yeah, I already know. I don't need to worry about this bit and it doesn't matter what I do in the air. As long as I land, we'll be fine. It's madness. And obviously, congratulations on getting the Olympic qualifying. I standard, would you call it? Yeah, yeah. I keep thinking time because I'm so used to like <laughs> where it's like everything's times this, that, whereas like yours isn't. And I think that's one thing that's so unique about what you do. And I'd love to dive into that is like, how do you set yourself up like the mindset for knowing that you, I just need to jump as far as I can. And it's not like you dive in and you can just go for it. And you know, if you hold your technique, the certain mm -hmm. bits that you can hold it together, like it can be so different. And how do you pick yourself up? It's not like you've just got one, you've got quite a few attempts. How do you pick yourself up if you've had a disappointing one or a failed attempt or whatever? I've had to learn that over the years, really. And, and I think the biggest thing for me is learning that if I have a foul in the first round, I need to treat the second round like the first round. I can't get flustered. I can't start to panic and go, oh, well, now I've only got two more attempts to make sure I get one in. You've got to just reset. Um, I think the biggest thing for me that I've been able to do that's been helpful is to just let myself feel whatever I'm feeling. Sometimes you try and push away because you, you can be out there for an hour and a half, right? Um, and if, if I have a bad jump, and I'm getting frustrated and I try and push away that frustration, all it's going to do is come back. It's going to keep coming back. I'm human. I've worked hard at this. Of course I'm frustrated. There's no way that I'm going to be able to completely remove the frustration. So I let myself feel it. I go, yeah, I'm frustrated about that. That's really irritating. I'm so annoyed that I didn't do these things, these three things that I'm supposed to be doing. But here's how the next attempt could be better. What was it that made that bad? And then you identify, you go, what's something, this is something I learned from um a mind coach that I was working with last year. And it's, you know, what something that was good, um, something that could be improved and what am I going to do differently next time? And that's what I take into every single jump and every single attempt. And I try and do that in training as well. So that I train my mind that no matter what, whether it was good, whether it was bad, what was good, what could have been better, what am I going to do differently next time? Um, because if you just get your mind into that pattern, then you start to think about that no matter what. And even if it wasn't great, you can always identify something good and you go, okay, keep that. Um, and you go, well, okay, what made it, what is it that made it so frustrating? Well, you know, I've been working on keeping my hips high and I dropped my hips in the last two steps. Okay. So what will I do differently? I'm going to keep my hips tall. And you give yourself very, very specific actions of what to do next, because it's not this, when I was a heptathlete, obviously I was racing people and it's so different when you've got somebody right there next to you, who you just, you just fight, you just you go they're there. I don't want them to come past me. I'm just going to go faster than them. But on the runway, it's just you. So usually that doesn't work. You have to give yourself specifics, process, very specific process goals. I absolutely love that. And that's exactly how I learned to, to control my racing in the end. In between, I mean, on TV, you see the coaches doing the sign language, whatever all these things mean. <laughs> um, and we've got it in swimming as well. Keep your legs faster, high elbow. Doesn't make any sense ah. to anyone outside of the sport. I can't imagine what the uh, the hand gestures that coaches do for long jump, but it's quite funny to watch on TV. And you guys, the athletes are like, they're like that. And it doesn't make any sense to us. Are you allowed to go over and speak to your coach? Do you have a certain amount of time or is it? No, you can go over as long as you don't, because usually a lot of the time we are in between to so the, the long jump pits here. The track is in between us and our coaches. As long as they don't interrupt your race, we're fine. You can go across and talk to your coach. You haven't got a, the only time limit you have is once you're on the runway, you've got a minute to jump. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can go and talk to your coach as much as you want, which is why it's so great for field eventers to have their coach come to competitions. 
Um, it, I would ask him, I mean, I know why, but still, I wonder why sprinters have their coaches. Like, once the gun goes off, what's your coach going to do? Best of luck. Like, yeah. <laughs> he can't Get help you. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, you know, we're out there for over an hour and um, one piece of advice between the rounds could change everything. Uh, sometimes you're so caught up in the competition that you just don't realize that you're dropping your knees or you don't realize that you're doing something really weird at the start of your run-up that you've never done before because you're just nervous and excited and your coach can see that and, and tell you in between the rounds so yeah I find it really really useful to have a coach there but then sometimes they can't be so you've got to learn to to sort of read your own your own cues and uh figure it out I usually take a little notebook with me because I will forget everything I've ever been told um when competition comes around because I'm just too excited and the adrenaline goes through and I, I don't know anything at that point so I've got my little trusty notebook it's, uh, it's like fluffy so that uh, I remember it because it's cute because it's fluffy <laughs> <laughs> a little tip for everyone there so obviously we've just touched on coaches yes uh, and obviously that's a very important relationship and everybody is individual and unique and that relationship looks different for every single athlete and um, so just I'd love for you to just talk through some of the coaches you've had and how receptive you are to different cues and you know are, are you the type of athlete that responds really well to positive feedback sort of negative feedback in a way mm, I'm highly sensitive so I definitely need to be talked to in a positive way uh, or I'll cry I absolutely have no shame I will cry right in front of you you tell me I was bad um and don't like temper it with something nice I'll just cry uh and I don't know what that makes me but it's that's exactly who I am so I have done best with coaches that are gentle or coaches that have just chosen to be gentle with me because you know a good coach responds well to each of their athletes and what their individual athlete needs rather than just has one coaching style and that's it um so my first two coaches Tony Williams and Jim, Jim Talbot were combined events coaches uh, they had me from when I was like 11 um, through to when I was 16 and they were brilliant, exactly what I needed then. We had a group full of combined eventers. It was so much fun. Um, Jim could be tough, but it was always tough love. You know, they, um, both of them were just really proud of the group and really, really wanted us to do well. Um, loved working with them. And I was a hyperactive child. Um, I'd come home from school and I was the kid that sold sweets at school. So anything I didn't sell, I'd eat before training. So I'd turn up just completely full of sugar. So I, I feel sorry for them. They dealt very well with me after a day at work. Just quickly, what sweets? Because everyone has their own. So back then it would always have been like Mauams. Oh, wow. Um, now popular. it's going to be, it's always strawberry pencils um now I'm pinballs let's make the specific distinction it's okay. got to be the pinballs um and kinder maxis those are my three that catch me with those three things after every competition they'll be in my bag that is amazing <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no 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 um and so then when I went off to boarding school that's when I started to work with Alan Lowell who was the coach that took me all the way through to the Olympics in Rio and like I no coach at, at that point I it was just me and him so we didn't have a group like at school we did and then when I left school and came back to him um really it was just just the two of us working together and we had such a special relationship I think he understood me so so well uh, before I even realized what it was that I needed as a person as an athlete Alan understood that so you know like we've talked about I like to do a lot of things um, and I think the general prevailing attitude in sport is that you should focus on your sport and that should be a priority. If you want to go to the Olympics, then you have to prioritize your sport. But Alan really understood that for me to be competing well, I needed to be happy. And for me to be happy, I needed to be doing lots of things. So he let me live in chaos. He kind of encouraged the chaos. You know, he would, when I left university to transfer back um, to Somerset to work with him, um, he helped me get a part-time job so that I'd have something else to do. When I said, oh, I failed my driving test, but I really want to be able to get around, he drove me to the a garage to pick up a um, an old Vespa that was battered. Um, <laughs> it served me well for a few years. Um, and when I said, oh, well, somebody said that they, they can help me uh, record some music and, and write a demo, he said, okay, well, you can do your training on the street uh in London just get on get on the bus and go because he understood 
what was important to me and kind of how my mind worked and how that transferred to how my body worked. And um, he'd block out the sort of two weeks around championships with, we shared a calendar on Google and he'd block it out in red and be like, this is the red zone. You're not going anywhere in these times. This is the time that I'm going to tell you just sit down and stop doing things. Um, and, you know, because he gave me the freedom the rest of the time, I always listened and um, it was a really great formula and it really worked for me. Um, so, yeah, that was a really, really special coach athlete relationship. Um, after the Olympics, he decided to sort of step back from doing full time coaching. So um, I moved on after that, but will always have such a special place in my heart because he, he completely understood me and coached me as a person more than just as an athlete. Um, my current coach, Lance Broman, is fantastic. I've been with him for four years now. We've got a big group of very high achievers. Um, I'm in a group with some of the fastest people in the world. So my group is mainly sprinters. Uh, I'm the only long jumper. We do have a decathlete, but everybody else, apart from me and Michael, the decathlete, are, are sprinters. Um, and when I was looking for a coach, so many people directed me towards Lance because he is a sprint coach, but with a jumps background, he was a jumper himself. And so I went there to work on my speed, but I wanted somebody that would be able to technically help me with my long jump. And he's been brilliant. Um, and similarly, he understands what I need a lot of the time. He's never as, um, it can be harsh with some other athletes, but I think he knows that I would just cry if he was too harsh with me. Um, and so he isn't, he's, he's very much a sort of kind, kind sort of toughness when it's needed. Um, and always kind of knows when to say the right things. I, I get homesick quite a lot, which I didn't expect from myself. I, you know, that surprised me even. I've been over in Florida and I didn't think I'd be homesick, but I was. He's let me come home early at times because he's understood that the benefit I'd gain from that would be bigger than the benefit of staying an extra week to do training. So, you know, throughout my career, I've been lucky to have coaches that appreciate who I am as a person and work with that rather than just going, this is how I do things and you've just got to get on board. As you said, like the the relationship is so important, but getting to know you as a person and not just the athlete, but how to ha what makes you tick, I think that's mm. so important. But as like from a spectator and, and coming from a swimming background, we always look at the athletes on the track and we're like, wow, like they look so glamorous, they look amazing, like your personality of what you get to wear. Um, and like, you just look like you're absolutely rocking the athletics track in jazz, like in all of your stuff, like every outfit, I'm just like, wow, like she just makes everything look amazing. And the makeup, like everything, hair, it just always looks on point. Whereas like with swim, swimming, we're obviously used to hair, it, wearing a swimming hat, goggles, probably the Yeah, movie. it's hard to be glam with goggles. <laughs> And then at the Olympics, we could only wear black swimsuits, so we couldn't even have like colours, which like always bring a bit of brightness. But how important is that, like as an athlete, having, I guess, your own take on how you look, what you wear, your hair, all that kind of, because that is part of you as well, the fashion. Mm -hmm. like, how important is that for you? Yeah, well, everybody's different. And for some athletes, it doesn't matter to them at all. But for me, the runway is, it's a runway it's a stage you're all here everybody in the stadium as far as I'm concerned when I stand on that runway everyone there is here to watch me and I, oh goodness wow hello everybody thank you so much for coming I can't believe you all came to see me most of them have no idea who I am but in my mind I'm standing there they've come to see me so I'm going to put on a show I'm going to look fantastic and you know what it is sometimes and this sounds silly but maybe you'll relate I we have the big screen right and sometimes the long jump kit is facing the big screen and if the cameras decide in that moment to focus on me, I can see myself on the screen. And if I don't look good, that's a distraction. I don't want to look up and be like, God, what are you wearing? Or what does your hair look like? My God, I want to look up and go, mm -hmm, you got this, let's go. And it just feels good when you look good. And for me, I like, I like a performance, you know, I, 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 I'm a performer in terms of music. I did musical theater as a kid. Like I, I like all eyes on me. And so if all eyes are going to be on me, I better look good. And you know, when obviously you're doing the clap, I love it when everyone's clapping mm. a lot. Does that actually add more to your performance? Yeah. Oh my God, yes. Yes. It feels like the crowd is pushing you down the runway. And I learned that as, as a kid, you know, at my first English schools, which is sort of a right passage in, in athletics in England. Um, it's, it's like the Olympics. It's, English school is wild. I, I, loved, I loved it so, so much. And that's when I first learned about the clap. 
Um, I was actually doing high jump when I first learned and I realized that one, it's kind of this, the rhythm builds and the momentum builds and you feel like you're really building to a point and it's just, it's all going to explode at the end. But two, if everyone's clapping, it means they've seen and they're, they're definitely watching. <laughs> so as if you're watching and I really better make this jump. <laughs> so it's kind of, I, I do better with added pressure. And to me, the clap, is added pressure. It's all, it's eyes on me and making sure that I deliver a performance for everybody that's come to watch. I have, see, I have noticed you with the clap. I wonder how that would work in swimming. I don't think that would work because everyone has to be quiet. <laughs> can you even hear anything? Um, you can hear noise. I, I could hear noise. I could hear my mum. So my mum would mm -hmm. always shout, go Lauren, Aww. as the gun went. So if I was diving or backstroke start, I could hear her. But other than that, it was just noise. Did you, could you hear jazz? Were you? Um, on a couple of races, I remember it being really loud. Um, but you could, again, it's just noise, no specifics really. But swimming is known for like people cheering you on from the side. They're like moving their arms yeah. wildly, going crazy, trying to push you on. So I guess that's probably the similar side of like pushing you on with their like arms, throwing you, throwing them down the pool. Um, I, I um, loved it with athletics when you could see them clapping with, and everyone's doing it together. And I must, I'm always like, that must be a great feeling. Oh, it really is. So with bobsleigh then, I know we're just flicking back to it, but you just said you want to look good. You want people to look at you. You've got a helmet on, you're in this thing. What's that about? We need to get pictures of you on the sides. Like this needs- You know what? You should see the bobsleigh women these days. They have glam and they, make, they find a way to make it work because so on the World Cup, and when you watch it on TV, they have a little graphic that comes up and like everybody turns. And, and when, they, when your name comes up, they have like a headshot that turns like this. <laughs> and you should see everybody's headshots. They're so glam. Trust me, they find a way to make it work. Yeah, you've got a helmet on, but like the rest of the time, these girls are glam and they're amazing. They are, these, honestly, bobsled women are incredible. Wow. I'm going to bring it down a bit now because we're the honest athletes and it's it's been amazing so far but and, and you seem super positive and I love your energy like just talking to you for however long we spoke to you I'm like I'm going to start a different sport I'm going to like this is great but in every athlete's life there's it's a roller coaster there's downtimes has there been I'm sure there has been but what's been maybe the lowest time or um your lowest moment so far that you've maybe thought I don't think I can do it or I want to give up or something like that, you know, a real low time in sport. And how have you got over that? I think um, the, my indoor season in 2016, so it was actually Olympic year. Um, I, I'd started off and had a really strong indoor season. I'd, I'd opened with a PB. I'd been competing all up near my PB for, for the first few competitions. And I managed to get myself an invite to the world indoor champs, my first world champs um and my invite was accepted and it was in Portland and I was really excited I had there was a few people that I knew from junior teams that had also made the team and so you know it was a really big deal to me and um up to that point I'd been known for rising to every big occasion you know almost every single championship I'd ever been to at that point I'd I had a personal best there um it was just what I did and that's kind of how either a personal best or a season's best you know whatever I had that year I, I it happened at the championship so I kind of was riding on this um, a personality trait that I'm, I'm the person that can, can bring it when it matters. And in Portland, I absolutely flopped. I had just one of the worst competitions I'd ever had. Um, and I just couldn't figure it out. I felt like it was a blow to my identity. It didn't just feel like it was one bad competition um, because I felt like a bad competition was just when you have a, a county meet or you know some random Grand Prix. I felt like because I'd gone to a world championship, the biggest thing I'd ever done and failed. It felt like, well, that's that's who you are now. You're somebody that fails in the big stage. You're no longer, because you've not carried on that chain of succeeding at big events, you aren't that big time performer anymore. And it really felt like, oh, well, maybe I was wrong about myself. And I think you spend years as an athlete building up your own confidence. And then when, if something that you do knocks it back down, it, it can be really, really hard to build yourself back up after that. And I'd have been in a, a less than ideal relationship at that point as well with somebody that didn't build me up. And so I think at the time, my self-confidence was so low um, and this really added to it. And I kind of was thinking, well, maybe that's me done because I, I, 
hadn't jumped far enough to qualify for the Olympics yet. Um, I was suddenly jumping worse than ever. And it was, it was really bad. It wasn't even like I just had a slightly off day. Um, I think I lost about 40 centimeters from what I've been doing that year. So it just, to me, it didn't make sense. I felt like the team had taken a chance on me and I'd completely let them down. Um, and it was just this kind of blow to who I thought that I was. Um, and it took a while when I got back to training to kind of feel like myself again, because I didn't have anybody kind of, um, you know, the, the relationship I was in was kind of awful. And I didn't have anybody there saying, no, don't worry, you, you can do it. This is the kind of person you are. You can, you can build yourself back up because of that. I'd, I'd split, I wasn't super close with a lot of my friends at that time because I would, I'd been alienated because of the relationship, but it was like a really isolated sort of alienated time. Um, to be honest, I was built back up by my friend, Lucy Bryan, who was a pole vaulter. Um, I moved in with her and we had just the most fun I think I'd had in such a long time. Um, it wasn't even about the athletics. It was about remembering that you're a fun person and people like you. Um, even if it is true that you're not an athlete that can, that can perform at big championships, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're any less valuable to me as a friend. Um, and I think that brought me back to myself. Um, and then I was able to get back to training and to build my confidence back up and go, okay, uh, one bad competition doesn't have to define me. I started to be able to see it as just a bad day, as just a bad competition. I started to sort of look at the situ situation as a whole and go, why, if you'd had one good result there, that wouldn't have defined your entire career. So one bad result can't do it either. Um, and I think that's something that as athletes, it can be really hard to learn that and to believe that that one bad result doesn't define you, but one good result doesn't either. You know, it's um, none of these things can tell you that much about you. Well, they can't say anything about you as a person, but they certainly can't tell you much about your overall career as an athlete. And as you said, sometimes we like can do a hundred positive things and one negative thing and we can <laughs> down on that. But it's exactly the same, like with social media, you can have like a hundred really nice, people saying nice things and then one person could say something awful but that's I guess the environment that we're around now um and with social media you just seem to rock it you're very open and honest with all your followers how but how do you manage I guess having that kind of social media presence with being an athlete and also I guess some of the bad stuff maybe some trolls and some bad comments from people as well um I just think it's funny I <laughs> I don't know social media is just funny like people are so weird and I think if you can remember that people are just so unbelievably weird then you don't need to take it seriously um it's it's a great platform for getting people to know who you really are you know in the past athletes have had to rely on the the print media and tv media to show their personalities to show their fans who they are and you know you've got that's somebody else writing about you to decide whether or not they like you but you can put out exactly what you want and I think I've gotten to the stage in my life and maybe it's just age or what that if somebody doesn't I used to be really really awful people didn't like me I needed everyone to like me it was just so important to me that everyone liked me and I'd you know go out of my way to irritate people probably that didn't like me by trying to make them like me and I probably just made them worse but these days it's just don't, I just don't care I, my block list is huge I'll just block you I'm not interested. This is my house. Go away. Like you don't have to come to this page and be negative. Like I'm having fun and I would like to continue to have fun. So if you're not here to have fun, you can go. Um, that's honestly how I deal with it. Twitter, the best thing to do on Twitter is just never search for yourself um, because everyone's mean on Twitter. And like, I, I'm sure that people only have Twitter to be mean. There are some well wishes, but Instagram is different because you have to actually seek someone out and go on their page to say something mean. Whereas on Twitter, you can just tweet something, you know, Jazz Carlin, her hair's too long. I, just, I hate it. Um, you know, if you search Jazz Carlin, you'll end up finding that. But it, on Instagram, it's, it's harder to, to do that unless they've tagged you. And then I just block them because I, my Instagram is a fun place. I'm having a nice time. And if you want to have a nice time, come join me. Like, we're going to do that together. But if not, uh, you can go. I definitely suggest 
everyone listening goes and follows you on Instagram because it is definitely a fun time to be over. Oh, right. so I'm, I'm just having a nice, you know what? I, I, I feel like I, I like to have company. And so if there's nobody there, I'll just talk to the phone and someone will reply and then I've got company there. That's amazing. And it's such a positive way of using social media. Like you say, there's so many trolls, but actually there are people to follow like yourself who it's actually just a great time to follow you, to be honest. So um, definitely go and do that. But on this podcast before, we've talked about the, as athletes, we're actors in a way. Um, and some some athletes like to be seen in a certain way. So we had Laura Mazzaro on a couple of um, podcasts ago, and she was the number one squash player in the world. And she was known as the ice queen to everyone. So no one would ever really go and talk to her. They wouldn't want to be involved. They would just like leave her to it, you know. And, and she, was, she liked that. She liked playing that mm-hmm. role because she, she wanted people to fear her in a way. But actually get to know Laura and she's lovely, you know, one of the right. great people. But she didn't want to be seen that way. Do you have that role or are you literally just jazz? This is who I am. I'm giving it my all, you know, sort of thing. Yeah, that would be too tiring for me. Uh, I'm just myself out there. Um, I'm out there to have a good time and to do the best that I can. I don't think I could really do that if I was playing a part. Uh, and for some people that works and that's how they get, you know, they have to get into character to do that. Um, for me, it's not like that. I'm, I'm out there as me. Um, I identify usually in the call room and I know the girls now, so it's, it's easier. Um, but I'll identify who's going to want to be chatting and talking throughout the competition, who wants to be left alone. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll hone in on my fellow chatters because I, I just need, I need to be relaxed and to be relaxed, I need to be myself. Um, you know, when I was younger, people used to say, she's, she's not focused. She's, um, she's off talking to this person over there and she's bouncing around here and she's going to be wasting her energy. But I tried the serious thing and it just doesn't work for me. Um, if I go out there and try and be too on switched on the whole time where I'm in like this competition mode for an hour and a half I would be exhausted by the time the competition's over I am on when I'm on the runway that's when um I've switched to competition mode when I stand on that runway and I'm trying to give it my all to get the longest jump of the competition that's when you'll see me yell that's when you'll see me looking angry and really really going for it but I'm not one of these athletes that's going to stalk around for the whole competition with this big angry face on. I'm not angry. I'm having a good time. I'm having fun. You're not having a, is this not fun for you? Like, honestly, some people look like they are so miserable. You'd think they wouldn't even want to be there. I want to be there. Um, and so I'm not going to pretend that I don't. <laughs> well, we, it always looks like you're having a great time. So <laughs> at least we can see that. Mm. I know we've given a lot of your time, but um, and we're really grateful. But like what's coming up, obviously we've seen you achieve the Olympic qualifying time, but from what I've seen, there's quite a few people. When does the Olympic team get announced? How does that all work um, in the near future? So for athletics, we've got our trials. There are three spots for every event. Um, in the trials, if you finish in the top two and you have the standard, you are guaranteed a spot. And then the third spot is discretionary for anybody else that has the standard. Um, in the long jump, there are four women with the standard. So if four does not fit into three, someone's going to miss out. I'm telling you what, girls, it's not going to be me. Uh, I am fighting for my spot. I love trials. It's my favorite competition of the year because it's when the pressure is high and I like a bit of drama. Um, when is the trials? The 20, 26th to 28th. I'm on the 28th. Right, 28th. And where can we see Can we see that? Can we watch? I that? think it's, well, usually it's on BBC, but BBC haven't taken up the contract this year, which is very sad. I think it's being streamed on the British Athletics website. Perfect. So there will be, it will be available. And then the selection meeting. So if I don't make the top two, then I'll have to wait for the selection meeting, which will be on the 20th, the, the Monday. So it's the next day. Um, usually there's like a week or two afterwards for people to get the standard and prove their form, but there's not this time because the Olympics is early. It's like, do the trials and did you make it or not? Best of luck. We'll be there watching, 100% will be there. Just before, I, I would just love to quickly touch on the music because you are phenomenal. So here we are again into another avenue of like, what can <laughs> jazz do, everything. Um, and so we're into music, just, have you always done that in the background? I know you went on The Voice. What was that like? Where do you want to go with music, if anywhere? 
so I haven't always done music, but I, I did musical theatre as a kid. So I always like liked performing. I liked singing. Um, and then that kind of stopped when I was about, I don't know, 13, 14, because it just became, it was such a big commitment and I wanted to commit to athletics and I just, I had to choose and I chose athletics. Um, but then when I went to uni, um, I found myself with a lot more time again. And so I decided to learn guitar. And from there, I had a friend that um, set me up with some producers and we started to, to write music. Um, as a kid, I wrote poetry, which I never thought was anything. Um, and then realized that if I put music to it, hey, it's a song. Um, so I started to write some music. Um, I started to put covers and originals up on YouTube. And then the voice got in touch and we're like, oh, do you want to come on The Voice? But they asked me in 2015 and I was like, huh, I'm busy. Um, I'm trying to finish my degree. I'm trying to qualify for the Olympics. Can't. And they were like, oh, Olympics. Obviously, it's a story for them. They love a story. They were like, oh, well, why don't you come back next year after the Olympics? And I was like, you know what? You've got a deal. Um, so I went back on and I competed on The Voice after Rio, which was very fun. Uh, quite the experience. It's all fake, by the way. Uh, but it was really fun to do. Um, Team Will, and- right? Team Will? Team Will. How was that? Did you see him? Not really. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah. I mean, Will Ev's not going to watch this, is he? He wasn't interested. Oh, no. I know. It was really sad. It was a shame. But I got to meet some really cool other singers. And the experience itself was really good for me. Like, it, it put me in a position now where I think people know that if there's a sport music crossover, then I can be involved. So I've had other opportunities for that. I got to do the Commonwealth Anthem for 2018 for Team England. I got to perform at Sports Personality of the Year. Like, it's been so cool. And I, what, it, in terms of your question, what would you like to do with it? Ultimately, I'd like to release an album at some point. Um, the, the ideal is to tour once. I'd just like to tour once. I'd like to make enough music that enough people would come to, even if I'm supporting someone else, just so that I get to tour once, because I like performing. Um, and sort of, I don't know how musicians even get over it. It's amazing, the idea of a group, a room of people singing back lyrics that came out of your own brain, that's mind blowing to me. That is like a, a goal, is to be in a room and like stop singing and then the people sing music that I wrote. Wow, imagine. Uh, I, well, I'll be there, so <laughs> I, I'm, I can see it right now. I'm there. Jazz, do you do you think you could uh, go on stage with other jazz and get singing, as in Jazz Carlin? I am not musically gifted at all. All, all, all I ended up doing was playing the recorder at school. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love music. I would sat, dance, sing along, but no, I could. I'm not a performer at all. Um, used to obviously being in the water and just not great um at singing but obviously I remember even hearing one of your Ed Sheeran covers and it just blew me away I was like whoa like and the thing is sometimes you don't necessarily realize how like gifted someone is until you see it out on social media or YouTube or whatever so it is pretty amazing the power that social media can have showing off so many different talents but we can't finish the podcast without giving a shout out to Jazz Apples I don't know Uh. Jazz, but everyone thinks that apples have been named after me. They're like, hold on a second. How do I do? How do I get? Do I have to change my name to Jazz? You need to change your name. Yeah, they only sponsor people called Jazz. I'm afraid. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's the coolest sponsorship ever. Like the fact that they have two people called Jazz as their ambassadors. It's just so on brand. They are such a great brand to work with, and they're the best apples. So like, it's just, it's a dream collaboration it is a dream i uh when i went to america for training i forgot to take my jazz apple slicer with me and honestly worst mistake i've ever made um it is a game changer laura i don't know if you've got one if you haven't then oh, we need to get yeah, please okay. do send her one because it's it will change your apple eating forever Honestly, they're, and they're so great and so supportive. And I think even with sports, but uh, even my friends, I think, feel bad having any other apple now because I've just drilled it into them about having jazz is the best. We love <gasps> everyone around me now has jazz loyalty. Um, you know, if I if I see if one of my friends has another brand of apple, they'll try and hide it from me. <laughs> like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. There was no jazz apples, as though like I personally grew the apples. <laughs> I do feel a bit bad to be fair when I see an apple that's not jazz now because I'm just like yeah, right. I need to change my name I need to sort this out so they're the best oh, it's worth it <laughs> exactly worth it. 
I can imagine. It's definitely it worth it. They're, they, they are the best. But thank you so much, Jazz, for coming on. You know, even like the little bits that people can take away and from people listening um, from the story, there's so many different things and how to enjoy what you do, to love what you do, to like never give up and just to really give your all. Um, and so many bits. I've absolutely loved it. Lauren, what about you? Any Any final bits? Of course, there's final bits from me. Jazz, thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. I think you just, you're, you, you talk as if you're like 70 and you've <laughs> so much. And you just, it's such a pleasure to listen to you talk as if like, I, I don't, where do you get your maturity from and you, your wisdom and everything? Because it's, it's so nice to talk to you and just learn so much. That is such a nice thing to say. Thank you. I don't know. I honestly think it's just, I just do things. I yes. just say yes to so many things. I try and do a lot of stuff. And I think that's that's also what keeps things exciting. You know, when a year is going too fast, if I notice a year is going too fast, I'll just start to do different things. Because when you're a kid, the years seem so long because everything is new. And then you get into habits and patterns where you're doing the same things over and over and over. So you, you've got to change it up. You've got to just try different things. Otherwise, you're going to get it gets boring and yeah. I can't do boring no and I can see that and I love that <laughs> yeah and and we were we were talking we need a big final episode of season two when Jazz said you I was like this is amazing this is perfect and I'm so glad you've come on I'm sure our listeners are just buzzing to have listened to you talk but everyone can find you on Instagram like you said you're very active so please go oh, yes follow, follow I'm Jazz I'm there every day. I will post an insufferable amount of stories. Um, so come join me. Yeah, definitely do. We're all supporting you. Jazz, we're all behind you. We're blowing down the runway for, to get you that little bit further. And we just, yeah, we wish you all luck in the world for everything you continue to do. And just, thank yeah, you thank both. you for your time. It's been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for having me. You've been an absolute dream. Thank you so thank you for listening guys season two is now finished we hope you've enjoyed it make sure you catch up on all the episodes you've missed on spotify youtube anchor apple and we'll see you soon for season three